For some of y'all, it's your boy Dabby Daniel, Bitch Building. Guess what? Next episode, huh? Entrepreneur, CEO, the new PD to guess, Mr. Tyler Kid Clutch Productions. How you doing, brother? I'm doing good. I'm glad to be back. Did yeah. you miss me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, let's get into it, man. We got a very serious topic. Or several topics, I should say, in this episode. We got Diddy, P. Diddy, saying R&B is dead. We got the Robin Adams, Robin, the Rob Adams police shooting. Sorry, I got tongue-tied there for a second. Because it's just one of the same, more shoot, more black shootings and stuff. And we got black gun ownership. So, let's get into it. Tyler, what are your thoughts on uh, P. Diddy saying R&B is dead, brother? Well, my thoughts on it is I thought he was crazy at first, but I think he does make a good point. Mm. I don't think all R&B is dead, but R&B for males, yeah, it kind of is dead. Or, like you said earlier, it's slowly dying or life, life support. But um, for females, no, it's not dead. Because we got with you on that I think the male R&B aspect is dead because you back in the early days in the 90s yeah all these R&B artists and stuff and sadly yeah one of the most prominent R&B artists R. Kelly but he turned out to be a you know pedophile and doing all these things with the girls and stuff and that really dived a lot of stuff down with R&B in terms of the male R&B artist and all in terms of R&B music because now you got barely have any male R&B artists contributing anything anymore. So that's what I feel like, hey, that's what I agree with them in terms of male R&B is dead, but we have some female R&B artists. And also I feel like the culture of R&B has changed differently. It used to be about loving a girl and everything else and, you know, and everything. Now it's just about sleeping with a girl and having sex and, you know, whatever body count you have and stuff and getting explicit. And I feel like the culture of R&B has changed as a whole. From R from the 90s of loving all these girls and treating them like queens and stuff, to now it's just, oh, sleep around, sleep around, sleep around. Same thing goes with the female R&B artists. There's, oh, I want a man to love me and everything and show me love. Now it's just like, oh, get the bag and get all this money and all this stuff. And that's a problem as well. Like, the culture has changed. Well, I think on um, what you said about the females, the bag, no, nah, that's not really, that's not the R&B aspect. That's more of the hip-hop rap aspect of the female artists you would hear, like, from the City Girls and um, maybe a Cardi B. But I think from a um, female perspective, you may hear more, R&B type records where you hear like, hey, the girl is saying she loves this guy and all that and she's putting emotions and stuff on it. So you're hearing that, but I think from like we're saying with the male perspective of R&B, I, I don't think you can blame R. Kelly for that. I think he's getting a bad rap from you because I don't I don't think he destroyed it. I think that, that kind of was going on before R. Kelly 
first off of the scene. Mm. I, really, it's just... I think it's really the rise of rap becoming the number one genre in the world that really did that because I think, really, think about rap. Rap has become rock and roll. Everybody wants to do rap in some kind of... You hear country rap, you hear gospel rap, you hear rap and hip-hop in general. You hear um, people, rock stars, <laughs> acting like rappers. So it's just... I think that's really what's going on with it. And I think what you're saying that the 90s R&B guys was talking about love and all that, I think, to a certain extent, you may hit... And they... Now you said they just talking about sex. Hey, they were talking about sex then. I think really it's, the, like you said, the culture changed, but at the same time, it's, it really, certain parts of it never changed because the R&B songs of then is doing the same thing the R&B songs are now. It's just probably using more provocative language in it, but they still had, they were still saying like the same type of innuendo about the music, it still had the same concept. Mm. Like, it was trying, it's basically, they was trying, it was talking about sex. So, I don't see a difference in that department. It's just more, now, it's more provocative, in a way. More the sex, but I think it's really, too, it's like, you have people from, like, a previous generation, they're saying, like, well, I like, I like this type of music. This is not, this is, I hear people say it all the time about rap, they be like, when rap is dead. Oh, I hate the way it sounds now. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that it doesn't do this. I mean, the you, because you're probably from a different generation to where you're used to hearing a certain type of style of rap. But you could, I feel like, yeah, it's, yeah, the type of rap you may like is not on the radio as much now, but yeah, you could find it. You could stream it. Yeah. You can, get, you can go to the concerts. It's not dead. It's just not where you used to it yeah it's not basically as prominent like yeah. you know some people these older generation folks they're like rap rap used to be conscious and everything else and fight the power and all that stuff and now it's now it's all about gang 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 and killing and all this stuff and rap is dead rap is yeah, not I pure i don't think it's that and it's just like r&b people are saying well it's about this and that but it's like what people say about um it's like when Kirk Franklin came out with gospel, you had people, older people getting mad with him, saying, well, that's not gospel book. He's messing it up. You know, all that is dead. No, it's kind of, it's just kind of evolved into something new. And I think this is kind of what R&B is that what Diddy is saying is like, certain parts of it, yeah, it is dead. I do agree on that. But I think the other parts is like, he's getting mad at it because he's kind of saying, well, well, rap in my generation, well, not rap. R&B in my generation was this and that. And now, I, I don't like the way it sounds now. I don't like it. I mean, it's your opinion, but it's like, at the same time, it's everything must evolve at some point. You're That's right. you. Every, now, you, the way they used to sample music in the 90s and early 2000s, you hear singers and rappers, they're doing it now. They're sampling that type of music, but they're putting it they're putting their own imprint on it. And I think with R&B is, is that you're going to hear more of an auto-tune now. So that's why I think he, he's talking about with it being dead, there's not enough actual male vocalists that can sing their asses off on these records. And I, I agree. Because, but I think with Chris Brown, he has to get his credit what he's doing because I think he's really he really kept the entertainment part of r &B in the game mm. but I think um, I think the people who is used to is that type of Jodeci Key Sweat um, Usher that, that type of vibe or even like a like a Bobby Brown type vibe I mean you're going to get that, but it's not going to be the way you kind of think it's traditionally supposed to be. It's just, that's the way it, the music is kind of going. Yeah. So, yeah, that, on that, uh, yeah, I thought people this. Kinda, 
people have a different mindset too, and people are kind of going through the different things in a different way from what you're going through. Yeah. In that time. Yeah. So basically, it's all about perspective. It's all about basically, like, not everybody's going through going through the same things like you're going to be going through. In terms of, we're not going to deal with it the same way. We're going to deal with it in different ways. And also, I feel like the culture has changed from the previous R&B generations and how we talk about things. And so that's my thing about this subject, about Diddy saying R&B and dead. So what's your final thoughts on it? Well, my final thoughts on it is that really it's just, if it's dead, then you got to find somebody and you find somebody and sign them to the person that you think can revive it to the way you wanted to just do that and put some and promote the music if you want that. But I think overall, I think we got enough female vocalists to really keep it the way it is. And it, and it's, it's unique. So I think it's it's not really dead. That's what I want to say. Yeah. It's kind of dead in the way that he sees it, but it's still alive. <laughs> it's just different. Yeah. So, moving on, yeah, to close my thoughts on this is, hey, R&B is not dead, it's just being revamped and reformed and everything. You want to do something about it, just sign somebody that can bring it back to the old school way of doing things in R&B. But the next topic, we're going to talk about something more serious, which is another case of police brutality. This time, it was by the man, um, Rob A Adams. And there was an article that recently came out showing an independent autopsy shows Rob Adams shot by Senator Ber Bernal police seven times. So the autopsy was played by former NFL player Colin Kaepernick, who protested police brutality and racial inequality by kneeling on the national anthem. So an independent autopsy, let me read y'all the article. Independent autopsy reported involving the controversial police shooting of a black man in the city of San Bernardino concluded he was shot behind from behind seven times. Nationally known civil rights attorney Ben Crump is representing the family of Rob Adams. Crump says a surveillance video and autopsy report proved the shooting was not justified. He wanted to buy a house in Hollywood. He wanted to go back to college for business management, and he started dog kettle before he was before he left. So he was able to see his first puppies born. So he wasn't able to see his first puppies born. Timothy King, Adam's mother, said, On the day before she buried her 23-year-old son, King was still trying to accept that he was gone. When I say this, and this is pain, like literally, I'm in pain. Last month, St. Bernadette police shot and killed Adams after investigators state officers and answered a 911 call about a man with a gun. Savannah's video shows officers in an unmarked car, but Adams quickly runs away. None of the seven shots striking Adams, who we all see was retreating in the video, have have a front trajectory. It was paid for, yeah, paid for call to company. He said the shooting was unjustified. He says this, Benjamin Crump, there is no reason for them to shoot a black man run away from them seven times. Seven times. This is ridiculous, Tyler. But once again, this is nothing new when it comes to police brutality. So, what do you feel, that once again, that we're back to this discussion, what do you feel needs to be done about this? Because this is ridiculous. Well, the piggyback off of what you were saying is basically, I don't, I'm not familiar with this particular case, but these cases have been similar with police brutality, and I, I'm going to echo the same thing I've been saying. It's basically, um, if we want change, we have to demand that our local, state, and federal elected officials make the changes needed to stop this from happening. That comes with passing the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act in Congress and get this signed by the president. That means we have to get other forms of it signed on in all 50 states by governors and get things signed by mayors and we have to put more black people in positions of power on the local level as far as um, we need more black sheriffs we need more black police chiefs that represent the values that we 
want a coal. And we also need more black governors. I've been seeing that. A lot of black people running for governor now. We need more black senators in the United States Senate. We need more black attorney generals. We need more black DAs. We need more black everything, really. More black attorneys. We need more black people um, becoming cops. We need black people in the FBI. We need yeah, but my, I have to disagree with you on that in terms of black cops and everything else because you can have a black cop there, but if he's indoctrinated in police culture, then he's going to be responding to that. He's going to no longer see himself as black, but see himself as a cop. He said, well, I'm doing my job and everything else. He's indoctrinated in police culture because of police culture, they see themselves as a brotherhood. They see themselves as, oh, we're cops. We, we are... We are the law. We are the law. You know, they can't do nothing against us. We're untouchable and stuff. That's how they view themselves. And they're trained to prove whatever they see as a threat, they want to eliminate. So that's how they're trained. This is a culture of policing. And so you can have a black person, you can have a black police chief, but if they're indoctrinated in police culture, they're not going to fight for the people that they serve. And so what we need to do is hold these politicians accountable. Who are these DAs? Who are these police commissioners? Who are these attorney generals? Because you have a black attorney general um, where Beyond Taylor was killed in Louisville, Kentucky by the name of Daniel Cameron. And he's a sellout. He doesn't want to take, he doesn't want, he didn't want to take action against the police who killed Breonna Taylor. So you can have the black DAs and stuff, but if they're indoctrinated in police culture and you don't know who they are and what they're all about, then basically you're still going to have the same problem. That's why I feel like what needs to be done. We need to hold these politics accountable, hold these uh, DAs. Who are the DAs? Who are the police commissioners? Who is the curtain? Who is the man behind the curtain, basically? And find out how we can solve this problem. Because if we just sit up here and do the same thing like we did in the 1960s, then we're not going to make any changes. We have to make changes now and focus on the present and what we can do in the present day. And doing that requires us to hold these, po hold these people accountable. Who are these politicians? Who are these DAs? Who are these attorney generals and if they're going to say they're going to fight back against police brutality by holding these police officers accountable and everything else then we have to hold them fuel to the fire now there are some people who say that we need to be more militant when it comes to policing and what have you and in fact I'm going to play a clip of a person who says that uh, we need to be more militant and what have you he was a member of the uh, new Black Panther Party and everything and his, the brother's name was Khalid Muhammad. And I'm going to play to y'all an audio clip. Mind you, I don't agree with this, but this is what he has to say when it comes to police brutality. Well, you got to stop here to tell you the only way you're going to stop police brutality is you got to stand up and be brutal with this damn beast. You got to step to this cracker or it will never stop. You can moan, you can groan, you can sing, you can pray, you can recite, you can claim you know all the Quran, Old Testament, I mean uh, all the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, the Quran from Al Fatiha to Al Nas, you can know all the Medunata. You can know Maya, truth, justice, righteousness, harmony, balance, order, reciprocity. You can name those of the Netter system. You can go and study the Odu text and substantiate your position according to Odu. You can study the Ifa or the word or the icon or the Yoruba and run through the pantheon of the Orisha. You can call on Oludumare. You can call on Ilegba and Shango and Obatula and Oshun and Ogun and Yemonya. You can know all of that. Unless you're willing to stand up and step to this white man, we will never get out of this condition. So, Tyler, that was the uh, member of the or founder of the new Black Panther Party and everything. And he's very militant, as you can tell. And uh, mind you, I don't agree with this, but it's good to have different perspectives and different school of thought and everything when it comes to the discussion of police brutality. So, what are your thoughts on what he had to say when it comes to police brutality and stopping that? But I agree with your I agree with your first point on that is that 
yes, you cannot just put black people in there. But what I mean by black people is I'm not talking about just any old black person in the position. I'm talking about a black person that represents the values that we want to uphold in the communities. I'm not talking about just a corrupt cop. And that's really another thing I want to talk about with the cops is really the policing where we have to start with picking people in power and the policing is we can't just pick a person that's not racist. We got to pick a person that's not, that doesn't have a corrupt um, mentality or dictatorship authoritarian type of um, behavior and qualities in them. We have to pick somebody that's honest, that wants to uphold the law, somebody that cares about people, a person that really, we, we, what we need to do when hiring police is they need to have a personality test. That's what I suggest to see if they rep, if that job is the right fit for them. If they don't pass the personality test, they shouldn't be a cop. And that's really what that personality test would do is you had to ask, what do you, what do you believe about this? Are you a white supremacist? Do you think cops should be above the law? Do you think cops um, should, um, how should, should cops interact with people when shopping? I think it's really something we need to really elaborate on that's not really being discussed is that there's a real broad view of how policing can work in America, but nobody really wants to touch that piece because it's difficult. And the problem is really, I think number one is corruption and number one A is race, racism in the police department. If you, people think of a cop not being bad as a person, not being racist, but that's not typically what the term is a good cop and a bad cop. It's really what what are your values? What type of actions do you have? What type of person are you? Do you really, are you a type of person that likes to bully people? Are you the type of person that likes to abuse power? Are you the type of person that wants to have power over people? That's really what we should be asking cops. And then act what we need to ask them also, let's not get away from this part. Are they racist? Do they believe in white supremacy? Are they trying to uphold white supremacy? That's really what needs to be asked. And that's what really needs to be discussed with this. And I think what we can do with a personality test is put put different black people in front of some of these people when they're um taking these personality tests to see how they react and how they interact with them. Because that's really the ultimate test is corruption and racism. Yeah. And also, yeah. And also this, um, police brutality doesn't just happen with just black people. It's really about corruption and about the police officers feeling that they can bully anybody because they have, they feel like they're in a position of power. And they can just steamroll. I can get away with it. And you can't do nothing to me. I'm a cop. I'm above the law. I am the law. It's whatever the law is, whatever I say it is. That type of mentality. So yeah. it's really not just really about racism. It's about the statism. They work for the yeah. state. They work for the government. And when yeah. you're in a position of power, you they, some of them, some of them are, are feel like they're entitled. And that they feel that like I can do whatever the heck I want to do to these people. Whether black, white, Hispanic, whoever. They feel like they. Some of them really feel like they are in a position of power, and they can bully anybody with that power. Yeah, and that's and basically that's cool. what. I, yeah, that's basically um, what's going on. It's not just really just about racism and white supremacy. That is a part of it, and that needs to be discussed as well. Like you said, with the personality test, but also the core personality is when you're a cop, you should be wanting to protect and serve, yeah. not not just the state, but the actual common man, the actual people. The everyday yeah. people, the nine to five people, the people working jobs and working hard and and busting their behind just to just to, uh, protect themselves and everything else. And when it comes specifically for Black folks and police brutality, um, do you feel like we need to defend ourselves and everything and do what this militant person said, Khalid Muhammad said, and everything, and we need to physically stop police brutality? 
well, I want to address a few points. You're right on that, and I want to go a step further with certain, something else. Which we, another thing we have going on in the police departments is nepotism. You have a lot of these guys, they're second generation, third generation cops. And a lot of them, if you ask them why they want to be a cop, it's not because I want to protect, serve people, who help them, or I just love being a cop. You will hear a lot of them say, well, my dad and my grandfather was a cop. And I saw them. And that's like, that's not a good enough reason for you wanting to be a cop. Because that's where, that's where it shows where your priorities are at. Your priorities should be you want to be a cop because you want to protect and serve because you want to make the world a better place. You want to make it a safer place. That's the thing. And I want to address what you said about with that um, guy on the video. Um, I do believe to a certain extent that there has to be certain militant activities taken. But that's for self-defense purposes. But I don't think what happens is I can't. I don't think we can do this all the time because we outnumber with police. It. But I do think if you have, if you see police, I think really. Um, how do I say this? There are militia groups. I've seen them on CNN, and I've seen another one a few years ago. I think this is when. Um, in 2020, when that George Floyd got killed, and they were diff- the movement was taking off with police brutality, and I saw this guy on TV, I think it was in Louisiana, and he said he asked the cops because this white supremacist came down there trying to bully the black people in the neighborhood, and he asked the cops, "Why don't y'all do something about this and stop him?" And they said the cop told him. He said, we don't, we're not here to stop problems or crime. We come after it's done. We call us. And the guy said, this is what gave him the idea. Him and his friends, they went out there with guns. And they had mil- they didn't have military gear, but I think they had bulletproof vests and stuff on. Yeah. And they went out there to protect the people. So anytime white supremacists came out there, all you had to do was call them. They came out there and did it. And the guy said, he said, what that cop said was right. He said they don't come to um they don't respond he said they only respond to trouble, they don't come to stop it. So what he did is he came to stop the trouble from happening. And I think that's what we have to do too with stuff is if we have different type of, you know, militia groups or gun um groups, they're gonna have to come out there and they see they see police doing that, I think they're gonna have to intervene. Depending on how many police they are. Yeah. If we see like a police, one or two police officers, yeah, you got to intervene and come with your guns because they're not going to, um, the likelihood of them is they're going to they gonna get away and they're going to stop doing it. But what I want to also say is that um, with that is black people, I'm going to say this now and don't get scared. Some of them are going to get worried when I say this is that I think black people are going to have to start taking up arms and buying up guns because we saw sales of black gun ownership go up in 2020 after George Floyd um, killing in the police protests and Walmart even stopped selling guns because they were scared of that. And that's really, at this point, this is the only thing that has to really... um, take place and I think that's what people is kind of um, scared of and I think that's kind of what the problem is in the culture now is that since I said this before since the 70s America has taken away black masculinity or they dimmed it down just for that reason because they're scared of what may happen Yeah. and what I'm saying with that is we have to have the mentality of defendant but not offending and not, we have to stop trouble. We don't need to start trouble. Yeah. I mean by that is, this goes for everything. If we see white supremacists out there with their guns, we need to get the guns they got. We need to start putting force against them and let them know you're not going to do this. Yeah. Take a stand. Because, because that's what's... Yeah. That's what's 
that's what really is going on is white supremacists are scared of black people getting guns because that's when the order is going to be enforced. But another thing that needs to be remembered, we're outnumbered with guns, so we got to be strategic in doing it. You can't just go out there and start in trouble and then try to use the guns. Yeah, It can't work. But we have to defend because we have a problem. Yeah. In, in and out of the community. What was you going to say? I was going to say this. Uh, piggyback on what you said. White supremacists are cowards. Yeah. That same thing happened. That dude in Buffalo who went up there and shot up that um that um s- supermarket is yeah. a coward. Notice he targeted elderly black folks. He didn't target yeah. the young black folks because they had, they were a chance that they were gonna fight back against that. Dylan Roof when he shot up that church was a coward because he targeted people who were once again elderly and defenseless. We have the right to defend ourselves against tyranny and against white supremacy. And this is why I'm going to bring this up. This is why the Black Panther Party of self-defense was created back in the 1960s. They wanted to defend against police brutality and white supremacy. Now, I will say this. You can't go out there starting trouble, as Tyler just stated. Don't go out there starting trouble. This is only for defense only. Black people, I'm going to have to say this, because I believe this as well. Black people need to start getting guns and arming themselves and protecting themselves. Again, I cannot state this enough. This is purely for defensive reasons and defensive purposes. This is not for we're trying to do this and we're trying to, you know, fight back. This is purely for defensive purposes and defending ourselves against white supremacy. That's what we need to do this. And police the police. That's what this is for. And we're going to have to protect our communities and what have you. That's what this is for. This is ultimately, this is what it's all about. And so speaking about that, Tyler, do you believe in terms of black gun ownership and in terms of having organizations and militancy and everything, do you believe an organization like the Black Panther Party is needed today and or to defend our communities against the police and white supremacy or what are your thoughts on that and black gun ownership in general my whole thing on black gun ownership is really we need to start doing what they're doing look at what's going on these white people they're training their kids up at five years old on how to shoot guns and i'm not saying we need to start at that age but we need to start at 11 12 we need to teach them the responsibility of gun ownership. But we also need to lock up the guns. We need to have gun shelves and stuff. But I think we do have to start at a young age teaching the kids on how to defend the community and, and what to do when cops come around. If you see a cop come around, you better run to your parent or run to somebody, an adult in the community. We have to make safe havens for them. Yeah. We need to make safe havens for the community in general. Yeah. Because I'm glad you say with um, Dylan Roof, had they had guns in that church, I'm not saying that that wouldn't happen, but I'm saying it would have deterred him from coming in it. Yeah. So we need, what we need to do is, if you got a group of elderly people out there, you need to have people out there with AR-15s or different guns defending. Yeah. Outside, or shotguns, or handguns. We can't just, we can't just do that. We, we got to accompany the elderly to their cars, mm-hmm. into the building. We got to make sure they're safe. Yeah, have security That's detail. Like, have yeah. like the ushers be armed and everything else. And just in case something pops off, have I'm them be well trained. No, I'm not going to say ushers. I'm going to say just regular people. Yeah. I'm just saying, and in general, because if we seen, I heard, um, I think it was Judge Mathis, was, he gave a speech the other week and he was going off about, he said, it's sad that. Black men, they sat around during the protests, and what you saw was mostly women and children, black women and children out there protesting. Yeah. And that's where I'm saying what's got to happen is now black men, and they want their place back in society, they're going to have to be masculine again. They're going to have to get out there with cops. When you see cops doing stuff to your kids, you need to intervene. 
And I, what I mean by your kids is not just your particular kids, kids in the community. Yeah. If you see them roughing them up and stuff, you need to intervene. Mm-hmm. Because I've seen it. A lot of times with, I've heard, well, I haven't seen it, but I've heard people close to me say when cops and stuff, they got nasty and stuff, and you saw other black men and Hispanic men, they come up to them and say something, the cops go away and intervene because the cops become scared. And that's what really needs to happen now is that we need to, um, we need to do what I say about the, um, get the black people elected to these positions that represent our values. But we also, even if we get white people that represent these, we got to get them in there. We got to get them involved again, like we did with the George Floyd thing, to go out there, um, to, um, be out on the front lines protesting. And what the black men need to do is go out there, black men, women, children, children, we need to learn, show them how to use guns to defend the community. Yep. And we need black men out there to defend the community. And that means if you see another black, um, that means even with black on black crime, I know people don't want to talk about this, but you got a lot of these black guys, they're falling into the mess and they're killing each other. And they're killing kids, they're killing old people in the community. We have to use, if we got to use guns on them, we got to do it to defend. Yeah, I know about that. We got to hold our own accountable and then we can hold the rest accountable. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. You got some people with the with the poverty mentality who feel like they can just bully people in our own community. It's like, no, nah, not over here. Nah. Train them, arm themselves and everything else. We're gonna have to if they have to use guns on them, so be it. Yeah. Because yeah. we can't be having this in our own community and then be complaining about the police. No, half of the time the police be called in our community because somebody in our own community is doing some something stupid. Or they be or you have some Karen's be trying to call us and harass us. But you have to deal with our people in our own community, and we could hold everybody else accountable. That's yeah, what I'm saying about that. Yeah, you're right. I agree. And we need to. When we see it, we we the only way that we're going to get the community back on track, we need to get the community masculine again because mm -hmm. there's a lack of masculinity in the black community. Yep. And that's why everything is out of control. You got kids joining gangs, killing each other. You got them having a bunch of kids and stuff, and they're not taking care of them. And you have the guy, other guys, they have a bunch of kids, and they, they don't have enough time to see all of them. And you have other guys that's out here just shooting yeah. people up, and it's like we can't have that. We have to. We can't just defend our homes. We got to defend the community. Mm -hmm. We need big, strong black men out there. Defending the community. Yep. If you see a person out there balling, balling kids in the community, you scare more. Mm -hmm. Tell them get away. If you see a white man running over here trying to uh, shoot up the community, you go shoot him. Yep. You take up arms. Don't be afraid because that's what happened. That's what used to happen back in the days a lot of times. With, um, that's why they was killing off black men a lot of times after slavery and, um, Reconstruction and even certain parts of the civil rights movement because the black men they weren't letting anybody come and attack the community. Yeah. They, if you came out there and threatened their family or threatening their friends and neighbors, they came out with the guns. Yeah. And that's what we got to get back to. We got to come out there and defend the community. Yeah. As I said, it's purely defensive purposes and everything. Yeah. This is purely a gig. We got to defend the community, we got to defend ourselves. Our families and everything else to protect the ones we love and we have to defend the community against the police against anybody who would do harm in our community even some of our own and what i mean by that is too it sets the um modern day era now you got black people everywhere you got them in the suburbs you got them in the inner cities you got them in the hood you got them in beverly hills wherever you may be take up arms and defend the community yep the only way we're going to thrive again is if we everybody feels safe. Yeah. Because it, the only way we have to solve the problem, we can't depend on the outside to solve the problem. Yeah, we can't depend on no politician to solve the problem. We can't yeah. depend on anybody else to solve the problem. We have to solve the problem yeah. with our own communities. Yeah. But we need, to, we need to put more mentorship programs out there. Yep. Um, stop a lot of violence. We got to... Um, 
got to put more jobs out. We got to put more um, schooling, trade schools, all that. Yep. It all goes hand in hand. Yeah. We need to build up institutions to to have a community, have these institutions like trade schools, education, and everything else. And we also need to have a military arm of the men to protect our community. And when we see these out-of-control people that keep on harming and repeat offenders harming the community, that's killing, beating, battering, raping Mm -hmm. women, children, and old people, we got to stop it. Yep, that's why people have neighborhood... We don't stop it, we're going to stop it. Yeah, we have neighborhood neighborhood watches and everything and those type of things where... Where we basically watch the community and watch our neighborhoods and watch our areas that we're living in. That's all I'm saying. It's basically for defensive purposes to protect our community. That's it. Yep. We need to protect our churches. We need to protect our schools. Mm -hmm. We need to protect our businesses. We need to protect the banks. All that. Yeah. Because there's too much craziness going out here. And that's the thing, too, with the mass shootings in the school. We got to stop defending these cops. So we got to start letting them let parents that's on and train to take care of the situation. Yeah. This is too much craziness. Rather than them arm the teachers, we need to arm people that know how to use guns. Yeah. Don't arm the teachers. Somebody say, oh, arm the teachers. No. Don't arm the teachers. Nope. Yeah, they already have enough to deal with. Their job is to educate the students. They are, they're already stressed out with that. You need to have people who are well-trained. And know how to use guns, preferably former military people, military yeah. officers and everything that are trained and they know how to use guns and they know how to use them efficiently. Because we can't allow these politicians to solve the problem. They're not going to solve the problem. The school shooting problem has been going on for years now and they haven't done a damn thing about it. They want you to be sitting ducks and rely on them to have them solve the problem, but they're not going to solve the problem. It's up to the community as a whole to solve the problem. Don't arm the teachers. Have people who are well trained and know how to use the weapons. Yeah, or train. I'm glad that you said that because I was thinking about that too. I think what we got to do is um, we need to start recruiting guys as former military. Yeah. Women and men as former military and they know how to use these guns well to defend the community. Mm-hmm. But we got black judges out here. We need to start putting our own people. And putting them in security guard positions to defend the judges. Mm-hmm. And our other elected officials that's not getting um, security details. Keep them protected and their families protected. Yep. We need to we need to make sure our schools is protected by putting we need to recruit former military people and have them work as resource officers in the school. And let them allow them to give funding for them to use the um the guns and other weapons to um, defend the schools. We got to stop letting these inc- incompetent people try to run our communities. Yeah. We, we saw what happened in Uvalde, Texas. You saw what yep. happened in Uvalde, Texas, where the yep. cops were, were there and everything else. And they basically they were, were, and they were yeah, incompetent, not trained, yep. not equipped to handle the situation. And they were yep. a bunch of cowards. So yep. you saw that the state, the government, cannot solve the community's problems. Yep. It's up to the community themselves to solve the problem. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying arm the teachers because I know some people are like, oh, we need to arm the teachers, arm the te-. No. They have and their job is to educate. We need people who are well trained, preferably former military and security guards. Yeah. These people are well trained, they know how to use the weapon and they know how to use it efficiently. Yep, and we need to um also we need with the we need to hold gun training, more gun training classes in the community to show the kids on how to use the guns to defend the community. Mm-hmm. If their dads is at work or out of town or the grandfathers is not at home in town, yeah, they need to learn how to use it just in case an emergency strikes. Yep. And you got people shooting up the community. Yeah. But they, I will say this. They should not be able to have access to these um, weapons, gun shells, and stuff. But all, but when they turn a certain age, yes, they should be able to learn how to use them. Yep, fourteen, fifteen. They never know when they can use them. Yeah, fourteen, fifteen. Yeah, 
Because what we're saying is these white supremacists, they're teaching their kids at a young age. Yeah, they're teaching them early. How to be mass shooters. Yeah, they're teaching them early. They're thinking that's yeah. cute. I'm going to teach yeah. them early how to use what. Yeah, we need to train our people for defense and everything and train them to protect our community. Mm-hmm. And to uh, raise them up as strong, masculine black men, saying if you're a man, your job is to protect and defend not only your family, but the community as a whole. Yes. And care about the community. Yeah. Instead of, no, don't kill each other. Protect the community. That's what's most important. Don't form yeah. gangs to protect the community. No. Form neighborhood watches. You know, learn how to protect the community, protect the neighborhood, and everything else. Sometimes for some of our own, if you see wrong and everything else, don't participate in the wrong. Stop the wrong yeah. and everything. Because that's why the community is under attack. Because masculinity is under attack. Yep. We gotta come. We gotta save it. Masculinity then, in order to get the community back. Yeah. And Stronger than ever. Yeah, and what we're, we're we're proposing is not illegal. We have the Second Amendment. Yep. It's the right we to bear right arms. To bear. A right to bear arms, and also it says in there a well regulated militia. Yep, and so, that's, that's where I wanted to get back on too for what you were saying about the cops is that really, the, what people are not understand it, the First Amendment is under attack, especially for black people. So if you know the First Amendment is under attack, they're going to try to use the Second Amendment to um, infringe on our First Amendment. And the First Amendment says you have the right to freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of, um, I forgot the other one. And these people that's always saying they're pro-life, they said the, um, the Constitution, it says that you have the, li- the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In order for us to have all that, we got to have life first. Yep. So in order for us to defend life, we got to protect our First Amendment rights first, and then we need to protect the Second Amendment rights by getting guns. Yep. And protecting everything. Yep, this is the quote of the actual Second Amendment. It says, A well regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It's up to us as a community to stop these problems that happen within the community. The state is not going to do it. The government is not going to do it. Most of them, some of them are incompetent. Yep. These politicians are not are incompetent. And some of them, they, they end with the, they, with the um, white supremacists. Yep. Because if you look at January 6th, some of them helped them get in the Capitol. And you have many people that attacked the Capitol. They were police officers, firefighters, business people, teachers, and in communities. And some of them were millionaires that attacked this thing. So that's what we trying to stress is that you could be all the, you could be all have all these professions and you could still be there to protect the community. As you see what they're doing, they're attacking communities mm-hmm. and they have all this time. So we need to put in that energy to defend it. Yep. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. Just like they're defending their Second Amendment rights, we gotta defend ours. We gotta defend our First and Second Amendment rights. Yep. Like I said, we gotta defend the homeland. We gotta defend our jobs, churches, kids' schools, all that. Yep. We have to protect. The way we do it is upholding the Second Amendment. Yep, protecting Stop our community. Yep, yeah, protecting our community and everything. Yes. And defending our community because these white supremacists are attacking our communities. Yes. They're attacking our churches. They're attacking supermarkets. We're not supposed to live like that. Live in fear. No. Nope. And fear of persecution and fear of death and fear of oh um being killed at the hands of these white supremacist terrorists. Mm-hmm. We have to defend our community. Yes. And sometimes we have to, might have to defend against one of our own. Yeah. If they cause them problems. Yeah. So that's what I have to say about this and police brutality and gun ownership. And so what are your uh, closing thoughts? My closing thoughts is basically we just got to, like I've been saying, is that we have to defend 
the community. We got to defend our rights. We have to arm our people. And we have to educate our people. That's the way we're going to solve this issue. That's my final thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you on that. We need to defend our community, protect our community and everything. And bring masculinity back into our communities. So we need to train our men to be leaders, to think for themselves, to stand up, to defend and protect our communities. We can't be sitting ducks out here. We're having white supremacist terrorists attack us and everything else. The police are attacking us and everything. And we're not doing anything about it. We're relying on these politicians. No, it's up to us as a community to solve these problems within our own community. That's my closing thoughts. And that's basically the end of this episode. This is the Black Evolution. And we're signing off. Tune in for more episodes and listen to this outro music.